Welcome back. We're doing more work on the Mini Model S. Alright, so today we're making the, um, the uh, lower panel for the, uh, for the chassis here. And um, that lower pan, uh, it's, it, I want to do full nose to tail coverage. And um, for a bunch of reasons, uh, not the least of which is uh, I want it to look as much like a Tesla as possible. And they have a flat belly pan. And it's not for aerodynamic reasons. This thing's only going to be geared to go about 25 miles an hour, uh, maybe 30, uh, 30 at the most. And at that kind of speed, aerodynamics really aren't, uh, aren't a big concern. But uh, I want to do a, a full coverage lower body pan and uh, to mainly make it look like a normal Tesla from the underside and to sort of um, protect from debris. So it'll be nice and smooth. So I, uh, I have, uh, it's 43 inches nose to tail. This is about 11 and a half inches, so I wanted to go 14 inches wide here to get overhang for the body to rest on, and then cut the uh, cut the aluminum around the wheels and, and around the motor mount and that. So uh, I decided to use a piece of aluminum, and um, here I've got um, this is uh, 6061 aircraft aluminum and uh, T6 uh, heat treated aluminum. So um, that's what I'm going to fabricate the belly pan out of. And um, I was going to use G10, which is a, um, it's a composite material, uh, very similar to carbon fiber. It's a little heavier and a little weaker than carbon fiber, but it's about twice the cost of aluminum. And, um, and actually, uh, it, it scratches very easily, the G10 does. It's, it's black, which looks really nice, but when you scratch it, you scratch through the black surface down to a, a off-white colored um, uh, substrate. And uh, so it, when you scratch it, it looks terrible. With aluminum, you can see this panel is already pretty scratched. It was just a cutoff piece from an aluminum shop. And uh, when it scratches, it's silver material with silver scratches on it. It doesn't look as bad. Plus, uh, Tesla chassis, at least Model S chassis, are mostly aluminum. So I wanted to stick with the aluminum theme on this thing as much as possible. And um, so uh, I will be using the plasma cutter to cut this. And uh, that'll be sort of a, an, an interesting thing for you guys to see. So the first thing is to, to lay out uh, the, um, to draw out uh, this, uh, this panel. It will, be, it will be overhanging the sides. Uh, it's 14 inches wide here. This is um, 11 and a half inches. So it'll be overhanging a little bit over an inch on each side, and that'll give room for the body to lay down against. And it'll, the body will be fastened uh, up along that, that edge. Uh, and then I need to use the plasma cutter to, to trim the panel around uh, the front wheels here, uh, inward to clear the rear wheels, and also to go around the, the drive unit mount here. And uh, it will be fastened to the, to the rear uh, bumper uh, as well as to the front. So, uh, so yeah, I, the way this is playing out, um, building this, all projects have to go in a, in a certain, a certain pattern or a certain, um, certain items need to be done before others. And so, for instance, uh, I, so you really have to go in order on uh, when you fabricate complex uh, projects like this. So, for instance, I have to, um, in order for me to run the steering, the steering has to come up through the body at a specific location. And in order to get the steering to come through the body at a specific location, the body needs to be mounted in order to get that all aligned. Well, the body mounts down to the floor, that, that lower floor tray, so, in order to mount the steering, I have to mount the body. In order to mount the body, I have to have the lower tray installed. So it's, you know, one thing kind of leads to another. So the logical next step is to make that lower, uh, the lower pan or, or tray. So um, the very next thing I'm going to do here is take the wheels off just to, to provide access to the, uh, full access to the body of the, ch or the bottom of the chassis. I'll have the bottom, I'll have the chassis laid upside down on the bench. So yeah, I'll take the front wheels off 
and uh, leave the rears on. And um, so I'll show you why in a minute. And yes, for those of you that are eagle-eyed, you'll notice that the, the tread pattern on the front, uh, front tires is backward. So I just, I installed them backward by accident when I was, um, I installed them backward by accident when I was test assembling it um, at the, at, during the last video. So when they go back on, the tread will indeed be pointing in the correct direction. So let's see how rigid the chassis is. When I take this front wheel off, see if it's how much the chassis sags. So there's the wheel removed. So I know there's not a lot of weight on it, but there's essentially no sag. Put, put some weight on it. Look at that. That is, um, that is pretty stiff. Let me put this closer to the camera so you can see it better. So you can, you can see how, how strong that is. It just there's really no chassis twist, even when I put some extra weight uh, up there. So it's a uh, very stiff chassis, even though there really isn't any cross support. And um, when I install the floor pan, that will add more torsional rigidity to the chassis as well. So... Uh, the frame on this thing is very, very light. Uh, the um, the only steel on the entire um, entire chassis is this front end support and uprights. And um, uh, incidentally, I will be adding gussets right here. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, finish welding I need to do. Some inside corner welds on the frame, as well as some cross supports. And when I do that, I'll also be adding gussets here just to to add some strength because. Um, this will have a tendency of bending inward. Uh, but anyway, so this uh, front end assembly just for strength is steel. But what's interesting about that, this front end assembly, this small front end assembly in steel weighs more than the entire aluminum frame weighs. Uh, it's just amazing the difference between uh, steel and aluminum when it comes to weight. So now what I'm gonna do is flip this over. There we go. And um, so I can let the drive unit overhang. Of course, I can also rotate this out of the way. Let's see here. Rotate that back. Slide it down. There we go. That's pretty good. So I'll be able to lay the pan uh, onto the chassis and mark it uh, as I need. So we'll go ahead and do that next. So what I want to do is get this center left right here. There we go. Equal overhang on both sides. And um, now I can go ahead and mark this. Just using a scribe with a right angle on the end to um, to reach up and scribe the um, the bottom side of this panel here. So let's see here. So we're about to get here. We'll cut it for the And then you can see the here. All right. So. Let's flip this over and see how it looks. So there's our um, there's our scribed lines, and um, so I'll be um, transferring those to markers so I can see them better. But uh, that's what we'll, that's where we'll be cutting. I'm scribing right through the protective plastic coating down to the metal because since I'm using my plasma cutter, it will want to burn this plastic coating to the surface. So I want to be able to peel it off, but I do want to be, make sure that I can um, see my, my cut lines here.
the rear sections I'm going to cut away for the rear end of the car. So uh, tire clearance and equaling it up with the frame rail and then this is um, drive unit clearance for the mounting clamps for the drive unit. So now I'll peel the plastic off the front and then I can peel the, the, uh, the rest of the plastic off and begin the, pr the plasma cutting process. Stuff's very easy or very uh, very difficult to peel off. You can't just pull it; it'll stretch. You have to keep digging at it right near the surface of the material. shape. There's the front portion that I'm going to cut away and then the rear and this um, light blue colored portion with the plastic is um, the shape that will be left. So I'm going to pull this plastic off. I'll still have the scribed lines left and I'll use the plasma cutter to cut it all out. Now that I've got all the plastic removed, I'm going to transfer all of my scribed lines to Sharpie marker so I'll have something I can follow with the plasma torch. So we'll go ahead and do that next. I've got my handy dandy Sharpie here. So go ahead and transfer all these lines over to Sharpie. So there you go, there's the entire shape marked out. And uh, next, we will um, set up the plasma cutter and start cutting. So this is the plasma cutter. This is the torch for it. Uh, it's a device that's mounted up on the shelf over there. Uh, what this does is it sends uh, a very um, high-powered electrical arc between an electrode inside the tip. It's not this round surface, but it's an electrode inside the tip sends a very powerful uh, arc of electricity between that tip and the ground, which the ground is this lead here, and that will normally get attached to the material. However, since I have a metal table, I can attach it right to the table, and it'll transfer the energy, the ground, to the, the workpiece. So uh, I flip up this safety, and once I pull the trigger, see it's off right now, once I pull the trigger, then that sends an arc, and that arc pulverizes the, uh, the metal that it is um, arcing against and compressed air simultaneously blows around the arc to um, or through the center of the arc to blow away uh, the, um, the material that you're cutting. So again, an electrical arc turns the material actually into plasma, which is the fourth state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. It superheats the material to plasma and then compressed air blows that material away. 
So the compressed air just comes to 80 PSI right from my normal air compressor. It has to be dried. You don't want any moisture coming through. So uh, you can use a refrigerated filter dryer, but in my case, um, I use um, uh, a couple of uh, small canisters that, uh, that dry the air. And now uh, those canisters need to be replaced periodically, but I don't use it enough to matter. So uh, anyway, uh, I use a, um, a Miller plasma cutter. It's a, in, a small inverter style plasma cutter. And um, so uh, let's see, I'll show you that here. So this is the plasma cutter, and um, uh, it is, uh, you can see by the size of my hand, it's a very small, small device, but this will cut, oh gosh, um, five eighths, maybe even three quarter inch thick plate steel or aluminum, and uh, the thicker the material, the slower you have to, to draw the, uh, the arc through the material to cut it away, but uh, so that's my, my Miller plasma cutter. It is uh, in the back here. You can see the, the line dryers and it's plumbed, plumbed to my air source with an on off valve there. So that's the plasma cutter. And um, we'll go ahead and uh, start cutting. Now what I typically do, oh, let me turn the unit on here. Uh, what I typically do is I will lay the material on the work table so the line I'm going to cut is hanging over the table to protect the table because if I don't overhang the material the plasma cutter will cut right into the table and when you're cutting there's no resistance it's not like when you're pushing a saw through material you can feel resistance with a plasma cutter there is no resistance felt whatsoever so I overhang this over the table and then I go ahead and I take a straight edge. Oh, in fact, let me show you here. If you see, see that little chunk right there? That was because I was using this straight edge to guide the plasma cutter and it bumped over and cut right into my straight edge. So um, you have to be careful of that. So I lay the straight edge here on the material and with enough offset to make sure that the, um, the cutter doesn't, um, that it cuts at my line. And then I clamp it down with some large uh, vice grips. These are brand new vice grips. Just got these the other day. So I use these, these vice, vice grip clamps here. And uh, what I do is open them up till they're at just the right, the right size, and I clamp the straight edge down with the material right to my work table. And I do that on both sides here. Actually, in this instance, I'm going to go further away to allow myself room to, to pull the torch. So This is the job that uh, the shades aren't built for, so go to the welding helmet here. My work gloves. Go ahead and do some cutting. So you can see the nice clean edge that that plasma cutter leaves, assuming I, I clamp a straight edge there. Now on the back side, there is a bunch of um, slag that hangs off. You can see it kind of, it's just kind of um, soft stuff. 
that you can take off with a file or a grinder or sandpaper or something later. So um, now one thing I like to do also is drill a hole at the inside of each corner. So when I use the plasma cutter, I don't have a sharp corner there or I don't overcut. I've got a nice circle that I can run the plasma cutter right into. So we'll go ahead and drill a couple of those holes now. Oh, and since the plasma cutter does cut with heat, this, the, uh, the very edge that you cut uh, is going to be hot, although it doesn't generate as, it doesn't transfer as much heat into the material as you might think. So it's very warm, but it's, see, I can touch it. It's not all that hot. So but we'll go ahead and drill a couple holes here. You can see there how I drilled holes at the inside corner there. So that just makes it easier to, to plasma cut. But plasma cutting is, um, it is by far the fastest method to cut certain, certain, to make certain cuts, I guess you'd say. Uh, the, um, the primary cuts would be um, through material that is thin, but not thin enough to make it easy to chop with shears. If this was paper thin metal, I just use shears like scissors and cut it, but um, uh, it's, it's too thick to do that with, but it's thin enough that the plasma cutter doesn't, uh, doesn't take too long. If this were real thick, then the plasma cutter, you, you aim it and it goes really, you have to go really slow through it and it makes a mess and you got to grind the edge. But with material that's, I'd say somewhere between a 16th of an inch thick up to, which is, uh, let's call it, a millimeter and a half so anywhere from 1.5 millimeters or 16th of an inch thick up to probably uh, say five millimeters thick uh, which is um, just shy of a quarter inch plasma cutting is the best now over quarter inch or say six millimeters and up it um, it tends to leave an edge that's not it may be straight but it's twisted as it's straight so then you have to grind it the thicker it is the more edge finishing you have to do. And so um, oftentimes using a different cutting method is, uh, is preferable. Uh, but um, anyway, so that's uh, sort of my philosophy on uh, using the plasma cutter. So we'll go ahead and um, go ahead and clamp this piece of material down here. Oh, you can also see here on this clamp that aluminum slag. This is a brand new clamp, just took it out of the package, and that aluminum slag was um, what blew off of that uh, that part. So anytime you're working with, with tools and equipment that is um, this powerful or potent, uh, care really must be taken because, my goodness, you could, you could cut into your finger or uh, just otherwise do some pretty serious harm to yourself. So uh, let's be safe using tools, especially uh, such powerful tools as this. It didn't cut exactly where I wanted, so I'm moving the uh, moving my guide and then I'm going to make another cut. It's one nice thing about um, about using a plasma cutter. It's so easy to cut with that it's no big deal to make a second cut if you need to.
this is a red Scotch-Brite pad. Uh, these are abrasive, um, abrasive pads, and they, they actually um, are, um, they will deglaze the surface of most metals. So I typically, when I have a, a large sheet of aluminum like this, I'll go over it with this red Scotch-Brite pad and uh, deglaze the surface. You'll notice I'm not too worried about dragging it around on the bench and scratching it, mainly because it's already scratched. The one side will be hidden by the, it'll be capturing the batteries in that, and the other side uh, will be, um, this side that's already scratched, will be at the bottom of the car anyway. It's going to get horribly scratched just from normal use. So, but I'm deglazing the surface just to give it a matte finish and uh, kind of uh, make it a little bit more uniform and um, dull gray rather than the shiny silver. So, I also need to provide clearance at the rear to access the drive unit components. So. I'm unclear if I'm just going to cut an opening and leave it open or make a cover for it, but um, that's something for a future date. Now one other thing is that all of these welds will have to be ground at least somewhat lower um, so that the, the uh, panel can sit without bumping over these welds, so that will have to be done as well. So we'll go ahead and do that. And here's the pan. So there you go. So that's the bottom of the uh, the bottom of the cart. And uh, yeah, I uh, pretty much run out of time for today. So uh, we'll go ahead and continue tomorrow. All right, it is tomorrow, and we're back working on the floor pan. So what we're going to do now is um, drill all the mounting holes as well as drilling and installing uh, threaded inserts into the frame. So let's get to it. All right, so the first thing is to install the floor pan up on to the underside of the chassis and clamp it in place, making sure that it is um, properly centered. So we'll do that with a couple of clamps. These are the, the same clamps I used for um, the plasma cutting. Again, there's some more aluminum slag on the clamp. But uh, we'll go ahead and clamp the, uh, clamp the, uh, the belly pan to the chassis here. Make sure it's nice and centered. centered so the next thing to do is to mark uh, the areas of the frame rail uh, the areas where the frame rails um, are uh, the lines that they uh, that they have along the, uh, the belly pan so that I can get it properly marked and uh, to get the holes drilled so we'll do that simply with a pen here All right, I've got the frame all marked. So 
Next step is to release the, the pan from the frame and start to lay out where our holes are going to go. So, rear clamp, front clamp. Alright, so you can see there we've got our frame rails the location of our frame rails all marked out and um, so that'll give us a good indication of where we can put our holes uh, to fasten the, uh, the pan up to the chassis. Alright, so uh, first thing we're going to do is um, do some do some measuring to locate where we want our, our mount holes. Now this pan isn't just some decorative cover. It serves uh, many different purposes. Uh, it protects the underside of the car from junk getting up inside of it, but primarily it will house the battery packs, which have some weight to them, and supported on the outside of the frame rails will be the body. Now the body doesn't weigh much, but uh, getting in and out, I think most people are going to put their hands in the sides of the body and lift. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on the outsides of the of the um, the pan or the under tray here, as well as pressure in the middle from the weight of the battery pack, as well as just the compression of the battery pack. So there's going to be a lot of load on this this pan. So especially at the center section here. So at least at the center, there's going to be quite a few mounting screws and then there'll be probably fewer at the front and rear, but definitely in the center where the battery pack will live, <clears throat> as well as where the weight of the body will be pushing down on. Um, I'll have uh, just every couple inches there'll be a screw. Uh, if it were just an aerodynamic panel or whatever, I could probably skip every six inches and mount a screw. I'll put a mounting screw, but instead I'm going to have every couple inches there'll be a screw at the center section here. So in case you guys are wondering, that's the reason that I'll be using a larger number of um, of screws on this panel than you may think uh, is otherwise necessary. So, and for this I need to see better, so the glasses are coming off. Woo! Putting on some safety glasses that are clear just so I can see better. There we go. Stylish safety glasses. So, alright, I'm going to use, this is just a pen uh, which for long lines, sometimes a pen can be better than a marker, but for, for locating um, holes, I want to make sure I can see them well, so I'm going to use a Sharpie for that. There we go. Now I can take my measurement off of those screws and transfer that measurement down the frame rail. Also, uh, one item I want to point out, there will be another cross, uh, cross tie such as this at the rear here. I'm not sure exactly the location of it uh, because that ba that'll be based on the layout of the batteries. So once I get the battery packs in, they'll be I'll find the um, the section where um, I can uh, clear all the batteries and put one more cross tie. Once that cross support is in, then I'll be able to to put a couple more mounting uh, mounting locations for the pan. But we're not addressing that now. Also. Uh, those that have been watching this series for a while will know that not everything is fully welded. There's some inside corners. I need to add gussets to the rear bearing supports. I need to add gussets to the front. And all of that will be at a later time. Possibly in the next video, it's hard to say. But for right now, I'm getting the overall layout of the vehicle together so that then I can go back and take care of the uh, the individual items on the car that, um, that are, um, are lacking. So all of the details. So
now I'll go ahead and transfer all of these holes down to the chassis. that um, I don't need these little wing sections and these holes would be right at a weld seam so I'm going to go ahead and just cut those little uh, little sections off of the uh, off of the pan here and then we'll continue on just a tiny bit of float. Uh, I don't want the holes tight. I actually got very large large head screws with a smaller shank so that there could be a little bit of float within the hole. So you'll notice when I put the screw in the hole there there's a little bit of movement. So the, uh, the screw, <laughs> you always have to drop one screw. That assures that the rest of the project will turn out well. <laughs> anyway, uh, you'll see the screw is um, smaller than the hole by, uh, by a little bit there. That allows the panel to, to sort of float or to move around. Um, that's important when you're using uh, these threaded, threaded inserts, and I'll get to these in a minute here, because the threaded inserts don't pop into their holes in a perfectly centered way. So you always want to make sure that use a slightly larger head screw and a slightly larger uh, diameter hole than the thread size for your screw uh, would, would dictate because that allows a little bit of, uh, little bit of inaccuracy in, in hole location uh, without any problems. So that's what I'm doing here. all the finished holes. Now the next step is I'm going to go over each hole front and back with a chamfering bit. So that bit, that is that is this bit. Uh, it's also used for countersinking holes but I use it uh, or I'm using it in this application for just deburring the top of the of the holes. And uh, this is a, um, it's not a critical step but I find it to be important. I've just learned that even though this is very time consuming, uh, when it's done, uh, just the quality will be a whole lot better if you go ahead and, and take these finished steps. So what this does is it'll leave a very tiny V sort of bevel at the top and the bottom of each hole. But it's just a light treatment. You just, just do a little bit of, uh, just the tiniest little turn there. And all it does is it, it breaks the, uh, the edge off of each of the holes, that sharp edge. So, I don't know if this shows up on camera at all, but you can see that it's broken the edge of the, the holes there. So now they're nice and smooth, they're not sharp. And on the back side you have burrs hanging off all the holes and it'll remove all that as well. So I know these steps may seem time consuming, but they're really not that bad in the grand scheme of things. And um, ultimately, it, it just, it really helps the overall quality of the project. I found that, that many, um, many projects that are built in people's homes, well, they have that homemade feel to them. And, and not that that's a problem. I mean, people call it character or whatever. 
But uh, I just found that uh, I would, when I build something and somebody asks me, where did you buy that completed item? And I tell them I make it at home, and they look it over and looking all around, and they say, yeah, you made that? Yeah, I made that. Oh, wow, that, uh, the quality looks really good. And, and I, uh, I find that that is, um, uh, it, it's a good compliment. It's very rewarding. And I, I know that there's a, a big push these days to make things look homemade. Uh, my wife and I love shopping at, at, the, um, at the store Hobby Lobby for some of our home furnishings. And they seem to pride themselves on mass-produced items that look handmade. And I know there's a certain charm to that. And this thing will not be perfect by any stretch, but uh, leaving burrs on the edge of holes and rough edges and all that is just not something I like to do. So I'm going to finish up all the holes. I am going to go over probably off camera uh, and clean up all the edges around the, the panel. And you saw me earlier taking the Scotch-Brite pad uh, to, um, to the surface of the panel to break some of the glaze. Again, it's not going to be perfect, but... Uh, there's a difference between something looking quaint and homemade versus just looking hacked and thrown together. And I want to eliminate that hacked and thrown together look, and I prefer to do things properly. So, But there is a limit as to how much time I'm willing to put into a project. You have to do the cost-benefit analysis. If it's going to double the length of time to make it look 10% better, maybe I'm not going to do it. But what I found is it's more the reverse. A lot of times it takes 10% more time to make it look twice as finished. And those are the things that I'm doing here with clearing the holes, uh, just kind of um, deburring them and cleaning the surface of the material and that. Uh, it just, uh, it's that extra 5 or 10% of time that makes it look 90% better. So. So that panel is essentially finished, other than, again, I'm going to go ahead and um, clean off uh, the edges. They're already smooth so that I can't cut myself, but I'll smooth them out even further and make it look a little bit more finished. But So that's that. I'm going to move this panel out of the way and start on the um, finishing the frame holes and getting the threaded inserts installed. So this is a threaded insert. Uh, I use these also to mount the front subframe assembly to the mainframe. Um, these are smaller in size, however. But what these are is they're essentially like a pop rivet. They go into the hole, and then a, um, a tool crushes it. And when it crushes this, it flares behind the backside of the hole. And what it does is it leaves a deep threaded area. Uh, I could, this is eighth inch wall, I could just uh, power tap every hole and I'd have threads and I've done that before but it's only an eighth of an inch which means I'd only have maybe two threads to work with this will give me probably uh, if I look in there about seven threads of depth and it's steel so now I have seven threads of steel instead of two threads in aluminum so um, these are used a lot in the automotive industry and um, I just found them to be a wonderful um, addition to the, pro the projects that I built and they lend themselves for, for serviceability. And for those of you that are wondering why I don't either weld this panel on or pop rivet it in place, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, the main reason I don't weld it down is because welding a panel over a large area, number one, it can cause a bit of distortion from the heat. Uh, you have to weld it kind of in a certain way to keep it from distorting. Number two, it messes up the, uh, the tempering of the panel in that area. That's a 6061 T6 tempered aluminum panel or hardened aluminum panel. And um, if I weld it, it will lose the tempering and therefore weaken it in those areas. Um, also, I want to be able to remove the panel. And uh, with pop rivets, uh, even if I didn't want to remove the panel, I don't think I would pop rivet it. These threaded inserts with screws through them are far stronger than pop rivets. Pop rivets over time will begin to allow the panel to scoot. They, they get a little bit loose. And um, so these riv nuts, they bite harder than a pop rivet. And when the screw holds down into it, 
when you screw the panels together, the tightening uh, force of the screw actually uh, creates additional additional rivet clamping force in the rivet nut and makes it bind to the material even stronger. So, uh, so I'll go ahead and do that, and um, yeah, we will. Um, I'll install all of those, and we'll be done with uh, with this portion of the video. So. You gotta love cordless tools. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and chamfer the holes, same as I did with the um, uh, with the panel, with the pan there, and. Um, I'm actually going to do that a little bit deeper on these holes because I want the head of this to countersink just a tiny bit in to try and make it uh, try and make it flush with the surface. This is the rivet tool, the rivet nut tool. You thread the rib nut onto the, the end, insert it, squeeze it, and then spin it out, and you've installed it. So I need to um, change the insert for this particular threaded insert, uh, the insert in the tool to use this threaded insert uh, in the frame, and uh, then we'll go ahead and pop them all in. Now there is a little bit of effort that needs to be made in um, in setting the, the proper depth. So I always do one test first. Put the uh, rib nut onto the tool and there's a, a bottoming stop here that's adjustable and uh, so we'll go ahead and insert one as a test and see how it goes here. I think we might have gotten the uh, the depth setting just right on our first try. So let's go ahead and do another one here. Just for grins, I'm going to ruin one just to show you guys on, on camera here. Watch the end of that. See how it's crushing? So, and then uh, as you release it, you turn this and it spins the end to take it off. So. You end up going from this to this. So that's what that tool accomplishes. Here's what they look like on the frame. So you can see they, uh, I countersunk them, so they're not perfectly flush, but pretty close. And uh, they have a very finished look. And again, you end up with, with a lot. So and again, you end up with a lot of, of thread depth for, uh, for the screws to bite down into. So it's just a, it's a wonderful um, mounting method. diversion and um, weld up a few spots on the frame here.
Well, I just broke a uh, broke the tool here, the 1024 tool for my nut uh, inserter tool here. So let's take a bit of a break and um, order a new uh, a new insert or whatever they uh, new arbor. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, complete the rest of the rest of the nut certs for the frame here and get the belly pan installed. And I think I'm going to go ahead and countersink these holes a little bit further here. This, um, the heads of these uh, nut certs, I really want to sink a little bit deeper into the holes there. There we go, much better, much more flush. Um, what I'm trying to achieve in this is I'm trying to achieve a, uh, a flush surface. So these nut certs have that, that little shoulder that sticks up there, and normally that would be above the height of the surface of the material, but uh, what I prefer doing is countersinking the hole slightly so the nut cert drops so that the head of this is below the surface. There's always a tiny bit of protrusion, and I'll go around with the with the flap disc grinder and flatten it all out. But this is one of those details that many people overlook. Uh, I found that building a project like this, uh, a lot of the, the devil is in the details, but also the quality is in the details as well. Um, I'd rather take longer to complete a project um, to a, a better degree, uh, to just to a higher quality standard uh, than to rush it and know that the quality is poor. Now, they make a pneumatic version of this that you spin the nut cert on and it's a gun that you hook to the, your compressor and you pull a trigger and it, uh, it sets the insert and then you can remove it. And, uh, but for certain projects like this, I find manually uh, inserting is, is just fine. It, but if I were using, uh, using these nut certs on a daily basis, then I would probably invest in the pneumatic tool. Alright, so there we go. All of the, uh, the inserts have been inserted. So now I'm going to take my grinder and go around the surface and make sure it's nice and flat. Uh, and then I can go ahead and test fit the belly pan for the first time. And um, I want it nice and flat for a bunch of reasons. One of which is I want to gasket this to make it weatherproof. Not that I'll be running this thing um, in the rain, but you never know. I mean, it's, it's, you may as well make it weatherproof if possible. So, go ahead and put on my safety glasses and hearing protection and we'll start grinding. I'm going to go around it with some, uh, some light sandpaper just to clean up any burrs and to, um, well, just to kind of dress up the surface a tiny bit here. Now, it's important to note that um, this is a, um, a sealing surface. Uh, it's just a surface that the, um, that the belly pan will be lying down against. So perfection uh, on the look of this surface really isn't needed. Um, 
I would say that it's it's valuable to to put some extra time into some of these steps, but there is a limit. So I'm not building a Koenigsegg supercar here. If I were, every surface, whether seen or unseen, would be perfect. But that's not the case here. So um, as I said before, I, you do want to put the time and effort into, into making sure quality is there. Um, but there is a limit. So uh, I take all the steps I need to without too many steps that are really unnecessary. So we'll go ahead and lay the pan on and drive all the screws in for the first time. Now, I will be taking the pan off to add a cross support somewhere here uh, that um, because the batteries will be mounted here and there needs to be a, a support across the frame for strength, but also uh, to capture the batteries in the frame. But I want to mount the belly pan, then I'll flip it over, lay the batteries inside the pan, and mark the pan where that cross support will be. Then I can cut, weld in, and um, uh, drill and put inserts into that cross support. But um, for now, we're going to go ahead and mount the belly pan and um, see how it looks. Now, since everything was, was measured well and I've taken my time, this should just fit right down uh, without any issues at all. So. Now when you're installing something that is, is this long with multiple holes, um, you, want to, you want to put um, screws in the corners to, to um, center the panel properly before you go ahead and drive them all home. So that's what I'm doing now. And um, you know what? I'll turn this sideways so you guys can get a better view. This will give you guys a, this will give you guys a better view of what. You can see there's quite a few screws on it. So, let's see if I can get that a little closer there. So you can see there's a lot of screws uh, every few inches. And now the reason that I'm going to all this effort to use these threaded inserts rather than um, than pop riveting or just drilling and tapping threads into the frame, uh, pop rivets would work fine. But a couple things first. Uh, they're permanent. So once you pop rivets something on, you have to drill the rivets out. So that's a problem. Item number two, pop rivets over time, the panel will start to scoot. The rivets will loosen up. And that's just the nature of pop rivets. They really, they're permanent in that they're not easily removable, but they're not permanent in the respect that they will loosen up and eventually you have to drill them out and replace them. So um, these are, um, these nut certs are stronger than rivets. Um, they're steel, uh, so they're very durable. Also, when you tighten a screw, it adds compression. It adds compression to the nut cert itself, which actually makes the nut cert want to crush and bite even stronger into the frame. So, the tighter you make these, the the sn more snug the nut certs will be into the frame rail. So, lastly, um, this is eighth inch thick wall. Um, box section frame tubing, theoretically I could just drill and tap threads into the frame. There's a couple problems with that. Number one, I would only end up with maybe two or three threads of depth in that eighth inch thick. So I have very few threads and those few threads are in aluminum. Take the screw in and out a few times, suddenly the holes are stripping out. So uh, you end up with far more threads, it's six or seven or eight threads of depth in this, in steel, not in aluminum, steel's stronger. Uh, than aluminum and as you tighten the screw down it makes this nut cert grab even tighter into the frame 
So all of those reasons it's far stronger and it is removable. A lot of screws, so it would be a pain to take off, but it is removable. And um, so, uh, but also with this type of, of um, build style, the, the lower frame pan and then the upper panel that will hold the batteries down become stru structural elements to the frame. They actually add strength to the frame. Now, I'm going to flip this around and show you guys. So from this angle, you can see that, uh, let me get this closer here. From this angle, you can see the frame rail here, pan obviously, and then you can see here that there's an overhang on both sides. That overhang is the body will lay there. So, and the body doesn't weigh much, but climbing in and out of the body, I'll be putting my elbows on it and lifting up. So the, the plastic body is very strong. There's multiple thick plastic panels, so it can actually support, the sides of the body can support my weight pushing down on it. Um, but I needed to make sure that the frame could support it. So this belly pan is strong uh, 6061 aluminum, which is an eighth inch thick, that's three millimeters. And then it's not, again, it's not riveted down. Uh, it is screwed down. And you can see in this section right here where these wings stick out to support the body, there are many screws. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's 12 screws across this section that will be supporting the weight as I push down to climb in and out of this thing. So I weigh 180 pounds fully clothed. So that means that each side needs to take 90 pounds. And um, so we're looking at, say, we'll call it 12 pounds per screw. And uh, that's well within their weight bearing uh, limit. And this is uh, thick aluminum and it's aircraft grade, so it's not going to bend. It will tolerate the, the load. Um, also, it's thick and strong, so if I hit a rock or something hard, it's not going to pierce through and damage the batteries on the other side, just like Tesla does. So the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and lay out the battery packs within the frame. So there we've got our, our battery packs, and uh, go ahead and move the camera so you guys can get a good, good look at it here. So you can see there that uh, the battery packs lay in the, in the chassis here and um, up against the, uh, the belly pan, and uh, so there's the, the ground clearance. and. Uh, Pretty low. It's about an inch and three quarters off the ground, and um, so now if we come in the back here, what I'm going to want to do is put a, a frame cross crossbar, uh, probably back as far as I can get uh, without hitting a pulley, and um, that uh, that cross frame cross support will not only add strength to the frame, but it will prevent the battery packs from sliding back, and it will put the batteries in a somewhat sealed enclosure. We've got this section here sealing the batteries off from the front, the side frame rails seal it off, and then there'll be one cross brace at the rear. And the battery pack height is identical to the height of the frame. This is inch and a half, and the battery thickness is inch and a half. So uh, I'll be, there will be uh, installed an upper frame rail or an upper um, floor pan here uh, that will be uh, also eighth inch thick, either aluminum or possibly black G10 material, which is what I made the deck on the uh, large um, uh, skateboard out of, but that will be nut inserted and, and screwed down as well. Also, I'm going to have access to all of these. These are balance taps. Uh, these, are, um, uh, these taps are designed to check the individual cell voltages for each pack, and you can also balance the cells that way. Um, this car will not have active battery management system on board so periodically I'll be checking the balance of the individual nine packs manually. So so that's the way the pack uh, will rest uh, onto the chassis and the next thing I'm going to do is set the body down to get the height uh, from these frame rails. So I need to, to make the mating surface between the body and the frame. I need to fabricate the that rail and install it uh, that will capture the batteries at the rear uh, and um, 
then get the body mounted semi-permanently in order to work on the steering. And the reason for that is that the steering, uh, the steering uh, main column will be actually exiting the body through the windshield. There's a bunch of reasons why, and I'll get to that. I'll explain that more in depth when I get to that point. But the body has to be mounted in order to find the exact uh, exit for the for the steering column. And in order to have the body mounted, I have to have the frame pan done. Uh, and so that's why I did the frame pan so I can get the body mounted to get the steering done. I also need to go in and add gussets here. I need to add some gussets here. Um, and I have to finish welding. There are a few, a few frame joints that, uh, especially in the back, around the back bumper section, that haven't been finished welded yet. So a lot of work to do. I'm doing it a step at a time. Um, the, um, uh, I had to use the belt off of this for another, uh, another project. So I have a new belt that I have to put on it. And actually, I have the drive unit, the motor rocked back to lay this upside down without the motor hitting the table. But I have to adjust that back. So uh, in this area here, I'll have a, uh, first off, the brake caliper will be mounted right there. But then there will also be a support here that will have the motor controller and the ignition relay mounted right there. So um, the seat will be right here. Uh, the seat is, um, there's very little room in this thing. So everything is, um, space is at a premium. So. Uh, I'll go ahead and take the body down, lay it on the chassis, and see how it's uh, how it's going to lay there. So that'll be next. So I'll be narrowing the seat to fit uh, better between the tires and um, within the body, but the seat will be down low but move back, and uh, probably somewhat in about that location, but drop down. Um, so I have to narrow the seat. Uh, I'll probably be, be narrowing it through the center. I'll probably take a chunk out of the center, narrow it in, and then um, seam it back together. So there's the back side. This was just a seat that I got on eBay. So I think it was uh, $39 if I remember right. pretty good idea of how the body's going to mount at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the body and start doing some more work on the frame. All right, next I'm gonna go ahead and take the pan off and uh, do some welding.
I think that's it for today. So I got the um, I got the pan finished. I got this. Uh, I got the pan finished. I got all of the threaded inserts installed and ground down flush. And uh, I got this last frame support in, which is also a um, a battery capture um, rail. And um, so. Uh, I've also welded up a few more frame seams. I think for my next video, I'll be finishing up the welding, doing all the gussets, and uh, just sort of um, a lot of the detail work that I've been putting off up to this point. And uh, again, mainly there's a number of different frame seams that, that have to be welded and supports and gussets and whatnot. And then uh, beyond that, it will be um, mounting the, the body. It looks like the body will, will ride slightly up above that lower pan. So I'll be making um, sort of insert plates that will attach to the body and then also attach to the chassis and make the body easy to install and remove should I want to do that. And um, so yeah, one step at a time. Uh, this type of project is very similar to building a, uh, a full-size street rod or, or other custom vehicle. It's just smaller, so, but a lot of the same principles apply. You've got initial design, uh, you've got uh, uh, body modifications, chassis fabrication, drive unit uh, layout, uh, design and installation, uh, then you've got steering, you've got all the, the steering geometry, caster and camber, and tow in and tow out, all that. Um, and, uh, you know, mounting the, uh, in this case, since it's a battery uh, system, uh, mounting the battery pack, uh, setting up the, the steering from the, from the column up to the controls, mounting the seat, and just, it, it's, it really is all the, the same type of work that you would do on a full-size car. It's just smaller, which makes it, easier, less time consuming, less expensive. So this is part of what I love about projects like this. Also, a project like this oh, typically is going to take me anywhere from 100 hours at the low end up to three or 400 hours at the high end, whereas building a custom car is in the thousands of hours, probably 10 times the time of this. And um, so my electric bikes, this type of project, uh, they're a lot of fun because I can start with an idea and um, you know, lay it all out, uh, do all the design work, do all the needed um, uh, research for componentry and that, uh, begin the project, get it all done and working within just a small fraction of the cost and a small fraction of the time investment. And um, so that's what I love about small projects like this. So anyone that's, um, that's built a go-kart or a mini bike, I'm sure can, uh, can sympathize and, and completely understand where I'm coming from. So anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I will be, uh, I'll be working on this. I probably put a couple hours a week into it. And um, so as I stated at the beginning of the build, months ago, this is probably going to take about a year to get done, and that seems to be about right for most of the projects that I work on. So anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Bye-bye now.